Um, I think I just saw a ghost walk by you in the oh my hallway. God. Oh my god! No, it was a, it, he was. A, it might have been a ghost. It might have been one of those astral agents that I always see. Oh, but they're geez. keenly interested in this conversation. Probably an astral agent. Yeah, Did, you know about that stuff, or do I have to explain it to you? You probably know about that stuff. Well, look. Why? Why don't we start taping this? Because this is. Too <laughs> okay. Okay. Here. Here we go. Three, two. One. Welcome. And, um, oops, hold on, my, my thing, there we go. Welcome. I'm with a very distinguished guest today, uh, in my judgment, an extraordinary talent. Uh, Anya Briggs is not only, uh, I would call her an out-of-the-box psychic and medium that she just demonstrated to me off camera. We'll talk about it in a second. But I have found her to be uh, a very insightful analyst of exopolitical, political, and geopolitical events. And so it's that rare mixture of the what I call the vertical and the horizontal. And uh, in my judgment, uh, she has not been active inside the exopolitical community. She's been very active in many other other communities, but I want to wish her a warm, warm welcome into Exopolitics TV and the exopolitical community. Exopolitics being defined as, because we're, we're real sticklers in this community, uh, the uh, science of relations among intelligent civilizations in the multiverse. So there you go. Welcome, Anya. Thank you so much, Alfred. I really uh, think this is going to be an enjoyable experience. So well, I appreciate yeah. it. Y you know, I and I and I just have have to add this because this will be, uh, and I really want to ask my listeners to open all of their eyes, not only their two. 3D eyes, but their third eyes and all their astral eyes, because this will be a vertical and a, and a horizontal and multi-dimensional conversation, because we had just connected for the first time via Skype a few minutes prior to going on camera and recording this, and Anya said, "Well, I just saw, well, tell me what you said. <laughs> well, the doorway behind you, there was an astral agent or a being of some kind, human origin, um, an interloper, if you will, curious, probably a remote viewer, could be a ghost, it's hard to tell, but their bioenergetic field was very strong and very human, so I guess they're interested in what we have to say, and he just ran right by the doorway, <laughs> and he's listening on the other side. Yeah, and and my response was, it's probably an astral agent because yeah. I think ghosts are hang around. Or it could be an astral agent who died and is now oh. a ghost and just can't get rid of his habit of spying uh, on people. I see that. that. That that could be. Well, uh, very interesting, and thank you for that for that insight. I, I've got all all sorts of aids here to kind of you know, crystals and all kinds of things to kind of make it. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> I love this one. This is my favorite. That's beautiful. Now, um, let me ask you, but before, you know, as we, as we start off, are you, do you foresee, like, a positive timeline or a catastrophic timeline? What are you seeing for the earth and humanity as we're going forward now. I see a vigorous timeline that is joining between two. And there is a battle, again, not to overuse the term astral, but there is an astral battle going on that I would call a secret war, a war of consciousness, as well as a quite literal astral grid that has opened up, that has been militarized and weaponized, unfortunately. The problem with that is, is that the military has not managed to 
militarize the human spirit and they can't figure it out and are you still there your screen froze um, we're probably not alone that's interesting okay we're being protected all right i called in the big guns please let this interview go without interference they're saying we'll do our best but this might take some time. <laughs> okay, I think we can begin now. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> we were we we were talk you were talking about the positive timeline, but it's very uh, intense and you were about yes. to describe what's happening in the astral, which is an intense process. Okay, it's already been kicked up as far as energy goes. It's already been, as I call it, vigorous, uh, aggressive in the sense of kind of a competition, but more, believe it or not, in the playful spirit of something that is like a, a, a sport, a sporting event, where the two teams are competing for the prize of whatever glory you get from winning. It really is, the metaphor that I wish to use is something akin to that. And that the dark side, Team Dark, uh, for all their aggression, is losing. It's unsustainable. And I'm getting this through ritual days and things like that, which I'm keenly aware of, unfortunately, where a lot of Satanists and black magicians try to attack people like myself. And I have other psychic friends that have complained about that to me privately. It's not something the psychic community tends to talk about a lot, but even with protection, sometimes there in the past there have been really aggressive attacks. Lately, it's deflected or diminished greatly, and I can feel it on ritual days. Um, there is a lessening, if you will, of the strength. It's as if the blood is flowing out of their veins or the, the life force. And what it's doing, the effect is having a backlash on the people who are enacting these rituals. And they don't know what to do because they are in a hierarchical structure which is sort of, it worships top dog, underdog. And what's happening is the breakdown of hierarchies and the enlightenment of each individual person on the planet is, is happening. I know a lot of people like to be cynical about this and say that people are dumbed down, and yes, there's been an aggressive plan for that, and it is working in some respects, but in other respects, it's not working at all. And people are waking up to um, elements in the military that have tried to aggressively coerce people this way and that away from spirit, or people in the occult um, end of military things, or um, people who are service to self, like Satanists or things of that nature. They're finding that they're having, unfortunately, tragedies in their lives, personal, political, and otherwise, and that they're realizing that this boomerang effect is going to, forgive the terminology, bite them in the ass in the long run, and it's not working. So each person that wakes up, it's a weapon against the Illuminati. And each person that realizes the body-mind-spirit connection is a fight against the Illuminati. I don't know what else to call it. You want to put a tinfoil hat on when I say that word, fine. I'm just using a catch-all phrase that people will grasp. You can call it what you want. You can call it dark elements. You can call it service to self. You can call it whatever you choose. But this is what is happening. The rituals are not working. The impact is not as great as it was. And they're panic-stricken. They are genuinely panicking. They don't know what to do, and their their inversions are not working. They're back. They're backfiring on the people. And within two to five years, I know people who are going to either die. This is not a threat. This is just you live by the sword, you die by the sword, and um, your actions have ramifications. And if you become a sociopath and you choose to go dark and you choose to lie, and you choose to get in bed literally and figuratively with members of the military intelligence community, you will either have a soul death that will render you impotent and mute, and no one will listen to you, and no one will 
I'm sorry to say, it'll be harder for people to care about what it is that you say, or you will actually experience a physical death. And this is a warning, it's not a threat, I'm just saying, if people continue to do this, they will experience more and more and more violent backlash against them, because the planetary grid is not allowing for this to continue anymore. It is done. It's an old way of thinking, and it's reached its nadir, it's reached its climax, it is no longer in service at this time. You're going to have to take another bus, because that bus has left the building a long time ago. So... I really am saying any of the information that I give you is with a full heart and you have to look up. You have to, to realize that even if I say some of these things that I, I, we are going to cover in this interview that sound bleak, I want you to understand that humanity won. They already won. And this is not, I'm not a Rothschild agent. I'm not the CIA uh, one of the rumors going around now is that I'm one of those types. Uh, no, I'm not. So, really, it's it's okay to be cautiously optimistic, no matter what they roll out. I have in the past stated in other interviews that I was deeply, deeply concerned about a thermonuclear attack on the United States of America or any Western country. And... I have since found that the timeline has shifted so much that this may not happen. This may not be a reality. However, you know, we can't stop being vigilant. And there obviously there's skullduggery all around. I was not surprised at all when this false flag operation of the Boston bombing happened in April. In fact, I predicted it in January. Um, uh, and I was shocked when it happened. Happened, but I, I was not present because I knew psychically that this was going to roll out. And um, I'm sorry, Alfred, your screen just went a bit. Oh, oh yeah. there's, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of interference that 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 goes on. But when it's taped, actually, the visuals usually come out okay. I've okay. discovered that they play with the visuals to kind of confuse us as we're trying to speak during the interview. Um, if I may, I'm just doing a little energy work here. Yeah, sure. Okay, that might even things out a bit. They sure are trying hard with this one. They're going to be fairly yeah. aggressive because they don't want me to say what I've already said. I already said it in a James yeah. Gilwin interview, but we're going to go more in detail about it tonight here. And there may be some more context for it in this interview, and it may cover more things yeah. that they don't want me to talk about, which are serious. Yeah. Now, now let me ask you, it, what, is, what is fueling all of this? What is fueling the positive change? Is this like uh, the consciousness of, quote, source? Is, is this like, is that coming in into our universe and going, okay, this is it? Is that what it is? I mean... What's at the bottom of this? Well, actually, what fuels this consciousness grid is hatred of humanity right now. The ironic thing is, is that these black warlocks and these people have placed these negative placements on the energy grid. They put negative associations on holy places. They have buried sacred objects and kept them on the public that have significant power and. Um, artifacts have been cut from the public and sacred documents have been destroyed. This is this has been talked about um, by Douglas Dietrich and him working under the Satanist um, uh, Michael Aquino, right. who's colonel in the military. And what these black magicians don't understand is that that has a backfire effect. Once people become aware of the machinations of hatred to humanity, People have a natural reaction to survival when something kicks in and they want to survive. If you place all of these roadblocks in front of people to dumb them down and take away their will from the fluoride in the water and chemicals and processed foods and things like that, it only goes so far. It has It's a litmus test to see who can survive these, you know, that the Illuminati thinks they're doing us a favor by doing this. They think that it's only the strong will survive. And the reality is, is that the strong will survive. And those who will survive are the ones that don't work in darkness. 
they're the ones who embrace the true reality of our being, which is infinite consciousness. And it's not about hoarding. It's ascension technology, but it is also about revealing the plan as much as doing something about it to counteract the plan. Could, could you talk more about what you mean by ascension technology? There's a human consciousness grid, not unlike what's in the, the movie The Matrix. And I am a firm believer that there is something called predictive programming. And many of your listeners are probably aware what that means. But for those who don't know, just very briefly, it is a coercion of the media either through remote influencing means or direct means. And I do believe there's a lot of remote influencing going on here with Hollywood writers and producers and people who have the green light power. And then I also think that there are just some people in the upper echelons of, of, above the capstone who are in Hollywood who have guided this way or that. Um, Jack Valenti was one of those people who was a notorious illuminist who was the head of the... Uh, what was it, the ratings board. Right. And it's interesting what he rated inappropriate versus appropriate for viewing audiences. Um, right. A lot of the stuff that he rated appropriate, inappropriate for the, for the viewing board had something, just as an aside, to do with enlightenment, to do right. with awakening. And a lot of that was deemed vile or perverted or whatever. But it's amazing what he allowed... PG-13 allowances or ratings that were kind of shocking. I mean, if you look at this record of what was allowed and what wasn't. And yes, in theory, there was a whole board involved, but really the buck stopped with Jack Valenti when it came to what people saw and what rating of a film. He, he was one of those people who literally corralled viewpoints. And so you have this combination of people like Jack Valenti, who are Illuminati, no question in my mind, who control the masses through allowing what can and cannot be seen by different groups of people. And then you have the esoteric element of it with remote influencing that I know is being done to writers. I look at shows like Fringe, and it's literally like a play-by-play -play of what's happened in my life, especially in the first season. And I'd never seen the first season of the show before, but it is uncanny how much of my experience is in the show. And in fact, one of the characters who's a scientist actually says, oh, this reminds me of when I was working on MK Ultra." So there is an overt and a covert level of involvement here that has worked as part of the hidden hand of what we consider reality, what we consider life. And that is breaking down with the advent of the internet and the advent of society in general reacting on a visceral level to this hatred of humanity. That the Illuminati is, my guys are saying it's kind of they're ingesting it, almost like a food source, into the human soul. The biosphere is, is filled with things like heart and psychotronic technology that's affecting the bioenergetic field of every single human being in the Western Hemisphere especially. The Western Hemisphere is being attacked in particular for the battle for consciousness because we are the first world. So we are the ones who are the early adapters, if you will, and we set the tone for developing nations and everyone else about how to see things, perception, and the perception merchants are no more. Now we can create our own media, just as we're doing right here. You don't need a green light to get the show on the road, literally and figuratively. So that's a wonderful thing. That's a marvelous thing. I feel that making the media right now, each individual making the media themselves and contributing their own voice is, in particular is a very strong point to be made right now. And to wrest the attention from six networks or the six corporations that own everything, and just boycott it. Boycott Monsanto. Boycott Bechtel. Don't work for a military contractor. Don't work for a defense contractor. Don't get in bed with them. Don't be recruited by a CIA agent if you're a genius kid at MIT. Work for yourself and work for others. 
there is an economy to be had if you are just courageous enough and you get out of your own way and you let ego not decide, be the deciding factor in everything. Um, the way they get you is through flattery and ego and persistence. They are nothing if not patient. But unfortunately, that's also how they mind control you. And of course, that brings me to partially the reason why I'm here this evening. Um, what we both came to as a collective decision, I guess, because there must be other people out there who are sort of drawing their own conclusions at this time, about some things that have happened recently with our own, I guess for lack of a better term, community of ufologists and researchers and conspiracy theorists research advocates, that there's been a poisoning of the well somewhat. I'll just say it. There's been a corruption or an attempt at corruption, and all is not lost, but this is also on a spiritual level what we're going to talk about that has to do with making your own media and not putting people on pedestals and not having unrealistic expectations of quote-unquote revered people or people in the press or just because somebody's been on a television screen, they're suddenly important. No, you are just as important as anyone else, and you have a say in this, and you have a voice, and the beauty of this world that we live in now is that anybody with a computer or a smartphone can get online and talk about it and, and exercise their voice. It's very, very, very important because it has to do with our civil rights and our civil liberties. And... The powers that be are scared. They really are. This NSA thing that just happened with the exposure of this is just a starting point. But with other collectives such as Anonymous and people who are interested in civil liberties in general and the ability to express oneself without fear of reproach, um, fear of being harmed politically, physically, personally, financially, um, there is no internet kill switch that can be stopped for long. I just want to say that. To the powers that be that might be listening, as momentum is accessed, people will become more and more and more aware, and there will be off-the-grid grids created. And more and more and more people will be servicing these grids, energy grids, I mean physical energy power outlets, through non-local means. They'll create their own energy just as much as they'll create their own media and their own communications. So there is no internet kill switch no matter what these people say. And maybe this sounds pie in the sky, but it won't be stopped. It can't be stopped. With the advent of this person who, ironically enough, worked for Booz Allen Hamilton, which is not for long, but he did work for them, which I have a personal direct experience with that company. It keeps coming up in my storyline as well. Um, it's the ultimate irony. It's the ultimate, you know, cherry on the cake. Um, to have someone from within step forward is especially a bonus for people who wish to speak out about this. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just Let me jump in. Uh, uh, the latest the from my colleagues at Global Research is that the NSA may have set Snowden up to leak phony prison documents. Oh, I think there was definitely, I mean, we shall see. There's always bound to be some kind of... You know, whether that's their kind of face-saving, whether that's their face-saving, apparently... Uh, <laughs> apparently, the 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 Guardian will not release the PowerPoint that Snowden gave to them because they they think that it's a phony PowerPoint, and they think that they the NSA was tracking Snowden because they knew that he was going to be a defector, so they gave him phony documents to leak, which he was unwitting about. So, but that's fine. Reporting about this meeting that, that it kind of stuck in my craw, you know. And and he said, gone dark, they went dark. And and he repeated that phrase, and that, that really kind of jumped out for me. Yeah. Could you talk about that? What what are you referencing and who are these people? And 
What does it mean to go dark? What does it mean when a good cop goes bad? What does it mean when somebody accepts that first bribe or gets a little too personal with the subject and gets influenced unduly by the subject and doesn't remain, retain their journalistic composure? It's corruption. What is, I don't, I don't claim to understand what it means when someone chooses to do something unethical because that's not my style. It's not my style to do illegal moves. It's not, I'm just, it's not classy, you know? It's just a, a but, it comes but, from desperation. But, yeah, but, but, but going dark implies some kind of, some kind of, Moving from a light column to a column of darker entities. Okay. From a spiritual point of view, what does it mean to you? Well, there's a series of... How shall I put it? There's a series of conversations that are had with these negative entities, whether the individual realizes it or not. And some of them are focused and direct like that invitation. And there are real 3D agents that are stand-ins for these multidimensional entities that sort of take over people. It is really an invasion of the body snatchers type of thing. So these 3D agents who are saying, hey, come to Bucks County. Let's have a great time. We just want to get together and talk about stuff in private. Please don't tell anyone in here. Sign this non-disclosure agreement. Um, that's the 3D reality aspect of it. And then there is the world outside of that which is in the realm of the esoteric which i deal with that is of the realm of the unseen for most people who are not aware of this realm and i see entities working the room just like you would politicians glad-handing lobbyists they do it on an etheric level and there's a series of karmic com sort of karmic based or karma based conversations that these people have had Lifetime after lifetime after lifetime with the esoteric, with these, you know, uh, the, the parable I would use is, is Christ in, in the garden in Gethsemane, who's being tempted and being told, I can make you a rich man. You know, it's the, the parable of the devil whispering in your ear and giving you everything you ever wanted, except, oh, well, we'll just take your soul. That's all. You aren't using it anyway. Come on. Look, there's, there's dancing girls and, you know fields of grain for you to own and I don't know whatever it is that makes men tech you know men and women of a sort of a certain type I don't know what this is they're tough another another example I would use is the character of um, can't remember the guy's name he's an actor his name's Joe he's great he's in the matrix and he's this defector within this band of, of rebels who are trying to get away from the matrix and break out of the matrix he, in turn, becomes a double agent because he wants, even though he's eating gruel, he wants to feel like he's eating steak because he's just tired of living this rebel lifestyle and this, this hard and fast lifestyle that's just really hard on the body and mind and spirit because it's reality. He's in reality. And what happens when, when this, this series of dialogues occurs between him and the negative people, the negative forces at work, maintaining the matrix, it's the exact same thing that went on with these people at this event. They wanted fame, they wanted recognition, they wanted exposure, they wanted to rub shoulders with a billionaire. I mean, it's the most juvenile stuff. It's like, fame is so empty to me. I, I see what the consequences of fame do to people, and it's not pretty. I know famous people, and it's not all that it's cut out to be. You know, it's kind of empty in a lot of ways. I mean, there's a quote that I refer to that I heard somewhere once where someone said, if you have the choice between being rich and famous, try the rich. At least you get to have a private life. You get to be rich and be anonymous. But if you're famous and you want something from that, it's probably coming from an insecurity, which is where most of this stems from. And we're not supposed to talk about that in the UFO community, that people have real lives and their lives might, their personal lives might be a mess or there might be personal issues they're not addressed. Oh, no, 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 no. We'd rather talk about the research. It has nothing to do with the researcher. But the personal is the political. I am a feminist in that regard. The personal really is the political. Oh, and I can see the hate messages piling up with me just saying I was a feminist and that now I'm a CIA agent. And Don't project. You're, you're, <laughs> you're putting always, out very yeah, positive they messages. Say, they always say I'm 
projecting that the ne the people who confront me that I'm projecting and I'm a bully and I'm mean and I don't care about people. Hey, you are an angel of light. Go I'm a, I'm it. a I'm a crass opportunist exploiting vulnerable people. Now somebody's going to quote that and think that I'm being serious. Trust me, it happens time every single interview I do, the words get twisted. So I've given up trying to convince anybody. I just have to be true to myself and know that these temptations are falsehoods. And they're not real. They're illusions. Because what do you get in return? You get mind controlled. You get well, what? In exchange for a $200 bottle of wine that's probably laced with some form of scopolamine. What? It, it was It was a people going into a lion's den kind of situation. I don't know what they were thinking. Especially the people I counseled and I said, don't do this. It's bad. I really now, don't know what they were thinking. Could, could you tell me about more a bit about what you call the Dow Grace? Are those the Orion Grace? I think so. It was given to me by my guides as the terminology, but I have heard the term before. They're not really brought up that, that often. However, the Dow Gray, as I understand it, are particularly virulent precisely because they're mentally unstable. And people will, might want to take issue with that by saying, oh no, advanced races can't have mental issues. They've got to be clean in mind, body, and spirit. Well, no, they're not. In fact, the Dow Gray are the group of aliens that are situated currently hovering in two timelines, I might add, at the same time, concurrently, um, over what is now owned by Robert Bigelow, I might add, of R Bigelow Aerospace, the um, Skinwalker Ranch. And I believe it is, is it Nevada or Utah? The infamous Skinwalker Ranch where uh, the cow cattle mutilations take place and so forth. And really horrible, scary things happen at night there. There have been um, eyewitness accounts of some kind of like chupacabra type interdimensional creature killing the animals. I don't know. Um, all kinds of things are unleashed in that spot, and it's a weird dimensional reality. And I know people that have gone, and I chastise them for, why are you going? Don't do it. It's crazy. It's dangerous. Precisely because these beings, um, they are not able to replicate anymore. They are losing their ability to reproduce, and they have to use cows in particular, because cows, for some reason, have their, their genetic code is very similar to humans. There's only like a... I want to say something like a 2% differential between cows and humans on the genetic code. Now, that's a vast, there's a lot of room to breathe with that 2%. People think, oh, that's nothing. But it is a, a genetic similarity enough that they can work with it on experiments without um, harming people in, in hopes that they can revive their DNA somewhat. And um, they're using it primarily through the glands of the animals, I think it's the eyes and the the cortexes, the, the visual cortex, the um, mouth, the tongue, the genetics of the tongue, and the genitals, among other places on the body that these cows are usually found in in the area. And these beings are doing this, the Dow Gray, because they're losing their genetic ability to replicate, and they're, they know that they're dying. And the decision was made a long time ago to simultaneously incorporate two timelines at once. I know it sounds like a science fiction novel, but it's true. And what happens is when you incorporate two timelines at once, you go insane. You will rapidly lose your mind. So these people are doing something that has degraded them spiritually to such a level that they are only service to self now. For lack of a better word, you could say they're satanic even. Even though they're not doing rituals, in a sense they are committing rituals because they're abusing these cows and murdering them. And um, they, they seem to be, it's on an esoteric level, it is a form of ritual, I would actually say. But um, these same beings, not this particular group hovering over Skinwalker Ranch, but the, the same type of beings who are dying out are, for some reason, involved with mind control with billionaires like Elon Musk. I would go so far to say as they are involved as well with Bigelow. I don't think that's an accident that he purchased Skinwalker Ranch and he's involved with Bigelow Aerospace and the logo for Bigelow is a gray ET alien, which looks very much like the Dow Gray, except they're a little more humanoid looking than that. They're slightly more human body types, but not much. They're a little bigger than your average gray, but still thin, but more, it's creepy because they're more resembling of a human being a little bit, but they still have the features of a gray ET, but their bodies become more they're humanoid, but they look a little more closer to human. So 
And that's because of the genetic tests they've been doing and experimentation on human DNA with abductions of people as well that Bigelow is involved with. So these people are, uh, you know, they're kind of like, I would use the example of um, Nazi, uh, literally the Nazi um, sympathizers in Vichy France, under Vichy France in World War II. It was a similar kind of symbiotic relationship that the French local politicians had with the Nazis and in exchange for that there were favors and information exchanges and, and unusual privileges and things of the like and they, in turn for that they sold out the human race, they sold out humanity, they sold out the French citizenry and hence the need for the French resistance, you know, that was so strong within the French character because of this vile betrayal that had been going on in Vichy. So the same betrayal is going on with these industrialists and these capitalists and these, you know, I'm not against capitalism, I'm not against industrialism necessarily, I just, it's corrupted because it is a human ET element involved with ETs who are not kind. And they've ignored the requests of the benevolent ones who want to, you know, help people, help themselves. They don't want to save us, but they want us to have more fair and uh, sort of, uh, um, there needs to be a parity. There needs to be a tipping point at some point where equilibrium is established, and it's not there. It's, it's so far the, the 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 deck is stacked in their favor because of their negative associations with the gray ETs that we're talking about, and they've sold out humanity in effect. And these people who attended this event in November, I'm sorry to say, I don't mean to be so dramatic, but essentially they're no different than these Vichy loyalists the Nazi regime in France in World War II. It's the same kind of mentality. Like, ah, oh, la, la, you know, it just, it's just, you do a series of things to stay alive. In this case, it's not so dire necessarily, but you do a series of things to stay alive in a quote-unquote cutthroat competitive field where people are hoarding quote-unquote information from one another because they want to be the first person to speak about it at the UFO Congress and whenever and every February. You know, it's it's the same thing that goes on in academic circles where scientists will backstab each other and, and, and dilute one another's work. It's not like everyone who attended this thing in Bucks County were friends with each other. A lot of those people who attended hate each other, you know, but, uh, or some of them do at least. They don't get along. Not everyone got along, but they all went because it was this sort of like co-joined kind of mind meld thing that was going on. That's ET technology. There's some and, and, you know, I was getting text messages from one, the one person who invited me from the event, and he kept tell, giving me, you know, reports, like minute-by-minute minute reports of what some of these people were doing, and it sounded like people were just getting loaded. They were just getting loaded on booze, and things were getting more and more and more like a bacchanal, and it just seemed like a weird environment. Just a, a heightened state of mind was created at this thing that made people highly suggestible, highly lax, just very loosey-goosey, and uh, made them more open to saying and doing things that they probably wouldn't have done under normal circumstances, which is what uh, these people who organized this took advantage of. And yes, I know of at least three people who went to this thing who are not themselves and they were greatly harmed by it. They were taken away, you know, at different points throughout the evening or evenings and worked on. What can I say? By humans, okay? And now they're spreading disinformation through their work, and they don't even realize they're doing it, some of them. I don't think any of them are consciously, willfully doing it intentionally, but some of these people I'm highly critical of, who I've mentioned earlier, they are definitely worked over, and one of these people has had, that I mentioned earlier, who I will not name at this point in time, um, but you can draw your own conclusions here. I know for a fact I just had this corroborated by two independent sources, none, neither of whom know each other, that one of these researchers got involved with a military intelligence person in MI5 at a very high level of British intelligence, and they they got involved in a extramarital affair, and um, as a result, this person has been getting the lion's share of their information from this MI5 person who they are literally in bed with, or at least were in bed with for a while. I don't know if they're still together, but they might be, illicitly. Um, and 
this person, this MI5 person is knowingly spreading disinfo to this, this researcher. And then in turn, this person is spreading that nonsense on the web in interviews and things like that. And it's a total disinfo campaign. So that's really bad. What's the upside of that? When someone is worked over so good that they don't even do due diligence on their own subjects that they're interviewing, they don't do background checks. That should be a given in this field. Like, just have a fund set aside just to do a background check. You know, obviously, I realize background checks can be scrubbed clean if you're a black ops person, so I understand that. But at least try, for God's sake, at least try to get some corroboration going. And um, unfortunately, with a, I want to say, small minority of these people who attended, they don't even bother to do that anymore, if they ever did it at all. Which, yeah, that's an ethical violation as far as I'm concerned. They might say it's for creative purposes so that people feel comfortable enough to say whatever it is they need to say and, and in whatever guise they need to say it in. And then we, the public, need to draw our own conclusions. But I personally have a problem with that. I don't see that there's um, incongruence in, in doing a background check on someone. What's the harm at the very least? So, right, right. Now... Come, coming back to, 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 to some of the larger agendas, some of the overview, mm -hmm. um, what they call the transhumanist agenda. Mm -hmm. We've talked about uh, the, now the frequency implants coming down through chemtrails that one breathes in, they go into the bloodstream, they jump the blood-brain barrier, then they go into the brain. That frequency can be read. The brain is entrained into super quantum computers that are linked up to the quantum cloud, that are linked to a quantum grid, to a super grid of over a thousand grids, including the electrical grid, mm -hmm. that are linked to heart. Mm -hmm. And that are whose objective is to create robotized humans, to make humans robotized beings yep. and uh, in in the interview that we did with uh, three European experts that James I think uh, you know that but I think you saw uh, or perhaps didn't was was that there's an estimate very conservative that there were six million of these in Europe alone probably more because now they're doing public readings of people, they go out in public and they give free readings of people who are emitting RF frequencies. And if you're emitting an RF frequency, it mean, means that you have a chip and you're and you're entrained. You you are entrained wow. into the supergrid. In London, they did free readings. Forty percent of the public that came up to to uh, be read was emitting our frequencies. Oh, my God. In, in, in one other of their public readings, 100% of the public was emitting, emitting our frequencies, including a five-year-old child, so children are at risk. Oh, yeah. Now, all they need is your, all that they need is your DNA, which they can get from blood tests. So that's why all children now mm -hmm. are... Uh, are required to give blood at birth so that they can be put into the DNA bank for the brain entrainment. Yep, I've heard of that. And, and any medical test. Plus, there is hidden in Obamacare, which they haven't been able to roll out because uh, a bunch of red states uh, have, have refused to implement Obamacare, but a... A requirement for mandatory chipping, I've read, is hidden in Obamacare. So that, and Obama just came out, he said, we're going to have, we had the Manhattan Project in the 20th century, and in the 21st century, we're going to have the, 20, the Manhattan Project of the 21st century, which is the human brain, i.e., that is a Trojan horse for the transhumanist agenda. That's what Obama's all about, to chip yeah. everybody and yeah. robotize yeah. the human population, yeah. which is a Dow Gray agenda. Exactly. Right? 
So could you talk a bit about that? What do you pick up? What do you foresee? Is well, it going to happen or what, what, what's, what's going on? There's an attempt always of it to happen as long as there are sociopaths who are linked into this neural pathic network of these gray ETs who hate humanity. Again, going back to my initial statements about this basis for the awakening of humanity comes from our divine spark that is inside all of us and the hatred or the demonic influence, if you want to call it that, just... It's, it's all labels, it's all semiotics, it's all, you know, what you want to title something. But not to turn people off, but just to frame it in the, in the mindset of, yes, there are these beings who latch themselves on to humans because they are not able to survive without us, but they hate us nonetheless, and it completely corroborates a lot of things that, um, unfortunately, Casbolt is saying in his interviews, um, like him or hate him, I mean, he says some completely repugnant things, and he spouts off the most racist BS you can possibly imagine, but he is doing you a favor by showing you exactly how the enemies of humanity behave and think and act. And if anything, his words serve as not just disinfo or to cover his tracks, but to give you an excellent assessment and array of ideas about what these sociopaths think. And yes, the occult connection to this has to be made. There has to be an understanding of, okay, where does the human and the ET meet? Because you have to have the 3D, whatever you want to call them, some are shapeshifters, some are not. But they're all agents for Mars. And the Mars colonization, I get a very bad feeling about Mars. I personally think that there's a direct connection to the cult of uh, Saturn that is attached to this. And the occult explanation for this cannot be underestimated. If you look at the history of the, the titles that they give these probes and, um, and uh, space exploration and the number, the volume of... Um, people involved in aerospace who are involved with the occult, like Jack Parsons in, in the Masonic orders, like lots of people in NASA, lots of astronauts. I mean, I forget which astronaut it was, uh, but he, he, he had to decide between wearing his Masonic ring and his wedding ring for the, I think it was the Apollo mission, and he chose to wear his Masonic ring instead of his wedding ring into outer space because he could only bring certain artifacts. And he brought a Masonic flag, I believe that he wanted to plant on the moon, but that at the last minute was rejected. I mean, I'm wondering, I often think, what, what did his wife think when he chose to wear his Masonic ring instead of his wedding ring in outer space? Like, that speaks volumes to me about the occult orders within the aeronautics industry. And this Mars, the big picture issue, capital B, capital P issue, of, of this... Mars colonization obsession that this billionaire had who funded this event last fall speaks volumes to me as well about where we're going and the sudden and dramatic increase of articles uh, in the news about Mars colonies and space tourism and how all of these billionaires are unrolling private space tourist attractions uh, that are rolling out in succession between now and the next, I guess, five years. And to have Sir Richard Branson say in the recent New York uh, Magazine article about space tourism, when asked, you know, is it conceivable that people will be traveling in space for just as a regular commercial activity within five years? He says, oh, you bet your ass. Absolutely. Um, that is very troubling to me because in a lot of ways it's like the Wild West where everybody's trying to stake a claim and that's all well and good. I mean, but that's a whole other issue in and of itself about, you know, continuing on that mindset of colonialization and taking what's mine that was never really belonging to anyone in the first place and, and monopolizing it and, and controlling it and, and monetizing it. That's one issue in and of itself that's always sort of curious and worthy of exploration and monitoring. Then you have this other thing with the whole esoteric agenda and the whole hidden hand thing where you're dealing with Masonic orders and secret societies and secret schools of knowledge being passed down to these people and satanic ritual families and all this stuff that people want to make fun of, but are a part of our tradition just as much as 
you know, in the United States, apple pie and baseball, it's, it's hand in glove. I mean, I grew up, you know, there's a Masonic order in every town in the U USA, and I'm sure there's one in every town in Canada as well. Uh, you know, the, the Masons have a firm grip in the United States, at the very least. And worldwide, I haven't really speculated, but I would assume it's rather large. But really, in the U.S., it's very, very heavy presence. Again, this is where people want me to put on a tinfoil hat and say, you know, I'm, kook I'm kooky. But this follows a logical order and progression. If you look at what Jack Parsons was doing... It, he was doing satanic rituals with L. Ron Hubbard in the 1940s to, to enact a moon child ritual to create the Antichrist. And this is the guy in charge of the rocket program, the top scientists of the world. He was an unrepentant Satanist, basically. I mean, call it what you will. He was a complete fanboy for Aleister Crowley, and that's a fact. It's documented. And I get called a suppressive person by the Scientologists because I want to talk about the fact that L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, was a part of this moonchild ceremony, which is straight up Satanism. And they enthusiastically were Satanists about it. So nobody's hiding anything. Michael Aquino's work as a Satanist and also as a colonel in military intelligence working on mind control and, again, the same types of technology we've been talking about. And, um, he curiously gets off the hook for a child sex ring that he's supposedly, allegedly, supposed to have given anal warts to some little boys in some cases. Forgive me for being so graphic, but this is where it goes. And then people say, oh, James Caswell and Max Spears are full of, full of it. No, they're not. They have levels and layers of programs that are activated. I've seen this personally. I lived with Max Spears for six weeks of my life, six horrible, regrettable weeks of my life because he was a mess and um, he caused a lot of chaos and, and wreaked a lot of havoc in my life and uh, caused a lot of problems. But I have to thank him eternally for this because I got to see up close and direct and personal what it's like for a person with real dissociative identity disorder, real DID, does. And this is all connected, all of this stuff. You can't get from A to point, a, point a to point Z without including the mind control contingent in all of this and without including the occult asper, aspects of this and aspirations in this. And sometimes the people who are in the occult are mind controlled to want to go farther with the occult. So it's sort of like a self-replicating nightmare, if you will that only stops when people stop being mind controlled, really, on a lot of levels, and stop, and stop keeping up with the Joneses and stop the hierarchical packing order that is, you do this, you do as we say, or we'll kill you. Enough people have to step forward, and enough people have to get right with God about this, so to speak, maybe literally, maybe figuratively. It's not clear yet which is which, but in this case, but, you know, stop denying that this stuff isn't happening, there's ample evidence for it. It just doesn't get a lot of press. And realize that it's only a step ahead of Mars colonization where it's just going to be replicating the same system on another planet. When that happens, it's just going to be same old, same old. And if we're going to have the audacity to go to Mars and colonize space and other planets, we have to get right with ourselves before we do that, or else we have no business going anywhere in space. Because otherwise it's just going to be doing more harm and, instead of good. Well, well, are you familiar with, with, the, um, with the 1980s uh, CIA jump room program and Andrew Bishago and Brett Stillings and, and Bernard... Um, Mendez, who are whistleblowers from a program uh, and that um, using a great a great ET technology, mm -hmm. uh, and they're they're still trying to get precisely what the nature of the experience was. It may have been a chronovisor experience. It may have been some other type of experience. Uh, and there are other whistleblowers, Michael Relf, and um, Arthur Neumann, who have come forward and said that they also have been on Mars at U.S. facilities on Mars, secret programs. Now, Elon Musk and that whole crowd 
do not seem to be cognizant or privy to the fact that there's been a secret Mars program ongoing for maybe 40 years because I've written to those Mars programs. There's one that's based in, in, in Europe and said, here is the evidence that people, you know, that there's been a U.S. space program that's been going to, to Mars. There's a lot known about the Mars ecology, the, the animals on Mars, the various types of humanoids on Mars, you know, what the conditions are, and they, they just won't even, that all I get back is a form letter. Mm -hmm. So there, the Elon Musk is, I think, kind of a pied piper for the unconscious human population. Because right. to, to keep them unconscious about the secret Mars program. Right, I would agree. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ever since uh, the Mars whistleblowers went public, and I've been the principal exopolitical journalist that has brought them public starting in November and December of 2008, they have been systematically gatekept and excluded. Right, right. I've been, and, I can relate. I can yeah, relate. And, and I've been gatekeeped and excluded, mm -hmm. and I've been harassed, kicked out of institutions, had my project uh, uh, stolen, had, you know, this this money taken if it, if it was ethical grantsmanship, right. that million dollars would have gone to where five hundred thousand of it would have gone to actual witnesses who had been on other planets right. or who had been part of the extraterrestrial visitation program of the U.S. government. I'm not talking about the Orion Graves. I'm talking about it, you know right. genuine programs like with the Tall Whites. Just today, you have done tremendous service in naming and beginning to expose those institutions and those agencies and people who are gatekeeping against the authentic information from whistleblowers in this field. And you're part of the, I call it taking out the garbage. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm. In the, in the exopolitics field. And, well, and what I've said is that. 2013 is about taking out the garbage, and in 2014, we're, we're going to start <laughs> cruising. Well, my, my guides have been giving me themes of the week lately with little phrases, and the theme for the week of this week, and it's very telling because it's absolutely what's been happening is, um, the theme is, um, strike while the iron is hot. Right. And first off, I want to say thank you so much. I'm completely honored by the request of my presence at this through you. Um, and secondly, I want to say, you know, I was, I was bad mouthing conferences in general as a hierarchical right. structure, but that's because they're ethically void in a lot of ways. Oh, sure. In addition to being completely infiltrated by negative agencies and alphabets, oh, oh, uh, oh, lots of oh. bad things happen at these things where that have nothing to do with who's speaking on the podium. Just in these events, the ecosystem of these events are dangerous for a lot of people. Oh, they are and, like like the international the international U UFO conference. Yeah, abductions. Just never have never in 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 invited me. I've had long conversations with the director and owner of that enterprise. He does not believe in the afterlife. Uh, uh, the main speakers there are Antonio Hunales, who's one of the main journalists, and Stephen Greer, right. who's, a great, who's a great money maker. They are the two guys who are, we showed in our articles were brain entrained right. by the scalar, uh, by the scalar implants. It absolutely looks like so technology is like, you know, being so used. you know, and, and I'm and I'm so glad to have someone like yourself apart from me, a journalist and a public spokesperson, who, it's not just me that's going out, so I'm, I'm getting the flag, and <laughs> not only getting the flag, we'll both get the flag, but we'll, you know what we'll do, we'll just reflect it back. You want me to fall on the sword. You want me yeah. to fall on the sword. I'm a good soldier. Yeah, yeah, uh, great. Uh, you know. Yeah. Um, they're just, these events, you know, like attracts like. And I yeah. am normally 
I am very nervous about attending these things because I always have something negative happen. I get psychic attack. I don't know. I just, I've heard so many negative things about some of these conferences and I've intuited many things about these conferences that are way out there. But what I get is sometimes verified later on. And it's just very sad look, that people look, feel look, the need I, to congregate I, yeah, I mean, those unclean types of things. You know? No, 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 right. I mean, just for the record, my book, Exopolitics, which founded the whole field of exopolitics, I was prohibited and banned at the X conference, which Steve Bassett ran, from, from presenting my presentation on life on Mars. I was prohibited <laughs> for it. At the, at the European Exopolitics Summit in June of 2009, which they first approached me, and they organized on the basic of, basis of my address book. I gave them all, all my addresses of all the speakers that were there. They got right. from me, right. and, then, and then they kind of cut me out, you know. Uh, they prohibited me from doing my presentation on life on Mars. Can you believe that? No. Like, well, yeah, no, unfortunately, I can believe it, but... No, no, but, I mean, that's that's the... T well, it's the same thing with the Aaron Green Hicks thing. Aside from yeah. Casbolt, I'm the only other person talking about IBIS, literally. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, this nobody who attends a conference gets yeah. her attention, and suddenly she's on the air, and yeah. she gets 100,000 hits in one day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is disinfo, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You it's, know, it's, uh, she it's, has a uh, lot to answer to ethically lately. Yeah, there have it, been a stream it, of things that this woman has done that I'm very disappointed in, and she holds a big responsibility, and she's okay. She well, just jumped the shark. She, she might have gotten, been one of the ones that was worked on. At she this was. She was. Though. She's been worked on for a long time. Yeah. So she's so she's more to be pitied than yeah. Than it's anything. sad. She wants nothing to do with me. Fine, God bless. But yeah. it's she has a responsibility to uphold, and she's not doing it, and that's yeah. unfortunate. Uh, okay, Th this has been kind of like a court session in a way. <laughs> I know, <laughs> totally different from what I expected. But <laughs> most of my other day, uh, of the earlier part of my day, was was uh, spent organize helping organize our hearing of the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes tri Tribunal. Mm -hmm. Which is happening August twenty first to twenty fourth on um, <clears throat> alleged Israeli war crimes and its invasion of Gaza in in January two thousand and nine. So I don't know. This kind of spilled over a little bit. Wow, <laughs> that is an interesting parallel. The war crimes yeah. tribunal. Because man, I can't tell you every day of my life since I've woken up and found out I was a my lab. Have I not fantasized about getting my day in court, literally, and yeah. having my perpetrators who've done these horrific things to me in either a, even if it's just a truth and reconciliation type of thing, yeah. admit what they did. That's just a fantasy I have. It's kooky, yeah. I know. Yeah. It's crazy. No, but. no. So, so I was, uh, when I brought up that proposal to you, I... I was not being, uh, I, it was not an idle proposal. I, I kind of tried to lighten it up by going like this because I didn't want to, but I am a war crimes judge and we have a judge, heads of nation like uh, Tony Blair and George W. Bush, uh, guilty of crimes against peace, which is the most serious of war crimes, and they can't travel anymore. And uh, uh, the last time that Tony Blair went to South Africa, even Archbishop Tutu uh, called for his arrest. And there, there was a movement of the South African government. He had to leave South Africa on the basis of our judgment. So tribunals of conscience under natural law and under social law, the, um, the Geneva Conventions have, you know, our verdicts count because the normal courts are not carrying out these things. So when I said that uh, uh, I would like to, and I've called for this now for over five years, and that is either a Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission, which you've stated, you know, the South African style, or a War Crimes Commission. It's interesting that in uh, Jim Sparks' book, Jim asked me to write 
a little blurb for the back cover of his last thing where he's standing. He said, well, there was a big circle and half of them were reptilians and half of them were for grays. And they said, Jim, the only way it's going to work is a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, I've said that we have to establish the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And when I said to you, let's establish an Ethics Commission and would you like to be on it? There was like five years of research and, you know, I, I'm making a serious proposal to the granddaughter of the author of the, the Law of Nations and, and from the World Court. So that there is, you know, there is some traction here. Yeah. So uh, uh, I, I would like to, uh, to, to enroll you in that project now. You do not have to be a member of it. In fact, you can be a witness before it. But I, I just want to, uh, in fact, I would like to enroll you as a potential witness, but as a supporter in the process of getting it started. Absolutely. By all means. Thank you so okay. much. It's an honor. Yeah, sure. Great. And I'm more than happy to provide testimony, evidence. I already have the dental x-rays and all of the things going on inside of my body that are entirely unholy, entirely not of my free will or my conscious right. knowledge. And uh, it's technology, whether it's, like I said, animal, vegetable, or mineral. I want to know who, what, when, where, why. I want to know who did this when. Yeah. I and want, I want and, a resolution. And uh, what, what has been amazing to me and a great discovery over the past five years being involved with tribunals of conscience is that we operate under natural law and natural law is inherent in the design of the multiverse mm -hmm. and social law is based on natural law in other words criminal laws and the Geneva Conventions and you know contract law and all of that is they're a reflection of natural law which is based in you know as part of the universe mm -hmm. and so yeah, you know, citizens, tribunals of conscience have cosmic womp. <laughs> we, we really do function. So it's just a matter of, of getting together a, you know, the requisite number of qualified individuals and, you know, and we can gather in a, in a non-local way and, and local way and begin to... Uh, you know, it may take some time, but it, it will happen, I'm sure. I would yeah. welcome that. I would welcome yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you. So, well, I, I can't believe how many positive things have happened in this <laughs> this conversation. I mean, things that I've been wishing for for like 10 years. I've <laughs> just like materialized. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just, you know, cross our fingers and cross yeah, yeah, our but, toes. But, and <laughs> right. Cross our fingers in 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 a good way, but you know now I'm finding that so much manifests. I mean, yeah. it's just like you know, just like whoop, okay, it's just kind of happening. <laughs> it's a chain reaction. Yeah. yeah. Well, t tell me. Um, so we're we're sort of winding toward the end of this of this uh, wonderful conversation and and kind of happening and. Uh, what would you like to leave with our viewers and with our audience, you know, for them to look at and think about and chew on? Okay, I'm already getting the theme for next week here, uh, which is, and it's an overarching theme as well for the next year and a half to two years. And going into the next, the impact of the next, what happens in the next year and a half, two years will have an impact for centuries to come, quite literally. And uh, the phrase I'm getting is, don't be surprised what happens at all. Don't be surprised by anything. The phrase, I wouldn't be surprised if this happens, is absolutely important right now. To not be dazzled by anything and not be destructive about anything either. To just be, imp try to not be emotionally attached to anything that comes your way, especially in the next month and a half. It's now um, 
June 12th, 2013, as we speak. So the next six weeks are going to be very interesting in the direct short term. But in the long term, you're going to see a progress in fashion of people waking up and smelling the coffee en masse in a way that is just really special and really spectacular and really vibrant and positive and good. No matter what psychotronic weapons they pull out of their pocket or whatever, no matter what nasty surprise they have in wait, you can't be surprised by anything. And even if there's harm in the short term, there will be gain and benefits for the masses in the long term. Genuine, real progress can and will be made if people just wake up and take responsibility for themselves and don't get swayed one way or the other by either temptation or negativity. Um, the promise of something just out of reach or otherwise, it doesn't matter anymore. It's all illusion and you have to just get very zen and like the Buddha and just see it for all that it is and know that your human worth is important and that you are someone special and that you do matter and your spirit and your soul matters. Your soul is very important and I would leave you with that to mull over for a while before you Thank go into you. action, before you go into action. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, if people, uh, want to get in in a in a touch with you either to follow your analysis and ju ju journalism which I strongly recommend because as I said I think that you're you are the extraordinary coming together of super psychic capacity as a psychic and as a medium I I, I witness it here but also as a superb analyst at the exopolitical political, geopolitical, multidimensional, uh, interpersonal, psychological level, uh, but also you're a psychic and a channel and a medium so people can see you for the personal, right? Yes, Is absolutely, that it? absolutely. If, they, yeah. if they're interested in um, personal transformation and radical benevolence, please seek me out. <laughs> I am and, available. And how for can session. they do that? Uh, they're welcome to contact me either at my email, which is Anya is a channel at gmail.com, or they can just contact me. Um, that's probably the best way to reach me directly, but um, certainly they can check out my site if they want to see that. AnyaBriggs.com is still under construction, but there's a list of my services that are provided. And then you can still contact me at the at the Gmail address. That unfortunately you can't contact me right this second, as the site is it's public, but it's just not fully ready for prime time just yet. But Anya is a channel at gmail.com. That's the best way to reach me directly. And certainly, if you want to have up see updates and look more into what it is that I've been talking about this evening with you, uh, Alfred, by all means, have people direct me directed to rather uh, my blog, which is Anya is a channel dot blogspot. Thank you very, very much. I, I, I really am, uh, uh, I have been so uplifted and I've learned so much and I've been so expanded by this uh, conversation and interview and my, my own uh, just options have just expanded tremendously. So I'm sure that that will happen to everyone who's listening to this. Oh, God bless oh. Just as I said that, the, the just, just as I said that, are, are you still on? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Just as I said that last part, the video, the, my video, my video recorder. Conked out. Conked out. No, but I mean. I'm you hearing know, weird it, noise now. Do you hear that? Uh, no, I don't. I just not, heard not a, something that sounded like someone playing an, um, a cello. Yeah. Oh, and your yeah. video just conked out just now. Oh. I can't can, see you at all. That's interesting. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so this is... Uh, this kind of blows my mind. And uh, I'm hearing that noise again. 
Yeah. Sounds like someone playing a cello very low. Yeah, just as I was kind of trying to express the expanded pos oh, potentials. Yeah, trying to express the expanded potentials that occurred in this conversation, which to me were like amazing, right? Because my <laughs> whole world just expanded, right? <laughs> and with, you know, the implementation of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission of a multidimensional nature, which I've been trying to get going for 10 years, uh, uh, Are you there? 